Good evening, everyone. We will call the November 17, 2014 City Council meeting to order. First order of business is roll call. Heidi. Scott. Here. Drew. Here. Lewis. Here. Doyle. Here. Wright. Here. Estes. Here. Nordstrom. Here. Roberts. Here. Weifenbach. Here. Laurenti. Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. We will now recognize Pastor Scott Wiley of Word of Hope Church for our invocation. You are welcome to participate, but not required. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come together here and do business of our community. We pray, Father, for grace and wisdom uh, upon our council and upon our citizens. We pray for your blessing upon our community. We thank you so much for it. We just pray, Father, that there would be peace, that there be uh, harmony, that even though we may not always agree on things, we can do so without being disagreeable. We thank you, Father, for the privilege it is to serve uh, the good people of Rapid City. And we pray for your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor Scott. We are now on to the adoption of the agenda. Are there any additions or changes to the agenda? Motion by Scott, second by Roberts to adopt the agenda as is. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries. We are now on to our awards and recognitions and first we have Dave Manberg from Ward 4. He's our veteran of the month and if John Roberts and Amanda Scott could join me down front. In partnership with the Veterans Coordination Commission, we are pleased to present the November 2014 Veteran of the Month recognition to David Bamberg. Thank you, Mayor. David Bamberg was raised in Shreveport, Louisiana, where he stayed even into his first two and a half years in the United States Air Force when he joined in 1984. David attended Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana from 1984 to 1987 as security police billeting. In 1987, he attended tech school for the B-1B at Lowry Air Force Base for a year. Later in life, David went back briefly to, to Louisiana Tech to complete his Bachelor of Science degree in journalism. From 1988 to 1995, David was stationed at Ellsworth Air Force Base in offensive avionics B-1B and public affairs. During his time at Ellsworth Air Force Base, David married the former Marine Marnie Storm. Their first child was born at Ellsworth when they still had a hospital on the base. That goes back a ways. David's career in the military took him across the country and around the world. He was assigned to Holloman Air Force Base in New Mexico from 1995 to 1997, where he served in information management with the 7th Fighter Squadron F-117 Training Squadron. There he compiled squadron history going back to World War II, or from World War II, to the present. Also while in New Mexico, David and Marnie welcomed their second child. Then the family moved to Osan Air Force Base in Korea, where David served the 5th Reconnaissance Squadron, U-2, in information management, followed by Schriever Air Force Base in Colorado as information manager of multiple units. He deployed to Saudi Arabia, while, Saudi Arabia while with the 50th Support Group. Alderman Roberts. 
Thank you, Amanda. Right here. Okay. Next, David was the test control officer at the military entrance processing station at Knoxville, Tennessee. Here he administrated armed services, vocational aptitude, battery, and other tests needed for entry into the military, as well as developed training plans for the entire testing section. This earned him a step promotion to E-7. His final military assignment was to Buckley Air Force Base in Colorado in information management for the 460th support group and the 460th Space Wing and Public Affairs until his retirement December 1st, 2006. He continued to serve at Buckley as a civilian employee until transferring back to Ellsworth as a civilian work working at the Air Force Financial Services Center. David gave 22 years of dedicated service to the United States Air Force, but he, his service hasn't ended. Today, even after retirement, David has continued to fight for veterans issues. He is a lifetime member of the Air Force Sergeants Association and locally has served as the chapter's legislative trustee, vice president, president, and now senior advisor. On a regular basis, David has personally met with the offices of South Dakota's two senators and congresswoman to relay issues important to active duty, retirees, and their families. It's issues such as yearly pay raises, cost of living adjustments, retired pay and TRICARE health care. David, along with AFSA, has supported many activities in the local area from the Veterans Day Parade, Festival of Lights, numerous activities with the VFW and other organizations. Just recently, he helped or organize the Salute to Veterans Day at Main Street Square during autumn nights and his chapter is working with Main Street Square to continue that tradition for years to come. Today, David's two children, Patrick 19 and Ashley 18, are both re recent graduates of Central High School. Also, Ashley is currently attending Black Hills at the University Center. Marnie is the manager of the Papa Murphy's Pizza in Bacon Park and her sister manages the other store. Ironically, both kids also work at Pop Papa Murphy's, so chances are pretty good that pizza is popular in the Bomberg house. Sounds like it. David has served our country, our city, and continues to serve our veterans. His example of service and sacrifice makes him deserving of this honor, and we would like to extend our gratitude. Thank you, David. I just think, I'd like to thank my wife and my son coming up. He's not at work. Uh, my daughter was at work and at school. Uh, I continue to support the veterans, especially the Air Force. Uh, coming up this week, the international president for the Air Force Arts Association will be visiting Ellsworth. We will sit down with Congresswoman Nome's office, uh, Senator Thune's office, hopefully Senator Elect uh, Round's office. Uh, to continue to fight because even after we retire, our benefits aren't a sure thing. And the men and women in the uniform have, have fought, especially since 9-11. They deserve our support and our continued support. They've already paid what they need to pay to earn these benefits. Thank you. Thank you. Would you mind mentioning that? I'm asking Daryl to come up because when I read the briefing on David, what I was so pleased to see is that normally city council representatives and the mayor's office um, come up with the nominations based on you know what we see in the community and who contacts us and, and reading the articles and keeping up with what our constituents are doing. However, this nomination actually came from the community. And Daryl, if you would mind, because it's, I don't have it on the top of my head, could you please give a briefing as far as how David got nominated for this? Because that was very impressive. Sure. 
We have the Veter <coughs> Veterans Coordination uh, Commission that meets uh, once a month. All the vet different veterans organizations get together on the, the first Friday of each month, and they've been very uh, integral in looking out for veterans' interests and nominating veterans, deserving veterans, and I know David's been part of that group. He's been part of so many different groups, and in a previous life, I was involved with the congressional delegation, and, and I can speak wholeheartedly of David's interest in, in sharing concerns about local veterans with the federal delegation. So the Veterans Coordination was very integral in getting David and other veterans nominated for this process. And thank you so much. And David, thank you. Thank you so much. This is James Van Nuys, who's our Citizen of the Month. If he could come up along with our Ward 3 Council members, Chad Lewis and Jerry Wright. Van Eyes was born in Whittier, California in 1955 and has lived intermittently in Rapid City off and on for most of his life. He attended Wilmington College in Ohio and with a double major in art and music. He returned to the Black Hills in 1982 and began to apply his artistic skills to the landscape that he loves, the Black Hills, Badlands, and the small forgotten prairie towns of western South Dakota. Known regionally as one of the finest interpreters of the South Dakota landscape, his finely detailed paintings capture the most subtle nuances of prairie and forest light. James has a remarkable ability to maintain his exacting standards of quality and craftsmanship dramatically throughout this broad range of media, such as works in oils, acrylics, watercolors, bronze, and various drawing and print marking materials. His works in all media have been juried into and won awards in many national competitions, including Chicago's Oil Painter of America show and open exhibitions of the Salman Gundy Club in New York City. Besides being a well-known artist, James is a musician. He has long been acknowledged as the Black Hills' premier acoustic guitar finger picker. His repertoire covers a broad variety of traditional music, folk, blues, Irish, and ragtime. His original music incorporates influences from the Renaissance, Baroque, and classical music, as well as folk and New Age. Okay. As City Council President, I share, as a member of the Rep City Council, it is indeed with pleasure and honor to nominate Jim Van Nuys for the November 14th 2014 Citizen of the Month. My nomination of James is a formal gesture on the behalf of this community to recognize him 
as an outstanding community member. James cares about his community and has given back. His work as an artistic member of our Rapid City has helped preserve our community's history and culture. From his work on the mural at the Rapid City Regional Airport, the Veterans Eagle in Memorial Park, three presidential statues in the downtown area, his depiction of our founding fathers at Independence Hall, the Rapid City Police Memorial, Police Memorial and the artistic classic Picnic Near Interior are examples of his creative work and artistic genius. Rapid City is truly fortunate to have a resident artist of the quality and dedication of James Van Nuys. We are so grateful James is a part of our community and are proud of all the gifts and abilities he uses to promote, to promote the arts in our area. Thank you, James. You know, I first met James back in probably 1997, 98, something like that. Back in the um, Sixth Street Deli was really going, and he was showing his stuff down there a lot. And he started being a musician with my friends, not being a musician, but playing with my friends with the counter players down at the firehouse. Every he was the local band, I think, the entire summer, weren't you? Yeah. So he's uh, anyway. You always see him around town doing great things. He's very quiet, goes about his business, but he does a lot of good things for this community. It's really an honor to have him up here and have people like this in the community that are willing to step up and and just contribute like that quietly and without any need for recognition. So I think it's very appropriate we honor him tonight. Thank you. Um, my family has lived here for almost 130 years in Rapid City. And it means a great deal to me to be honored as a citizen of Rapid City. Uh, I would like to thank those of you in city government um, the Arts Council and other arts organizations and um, generous benefactors in the private sector who make public art possible here. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Do not have any general public comment items. Have I missed anyone on general public comment? If not, we'll move on to our regular agenda items. We'll, new, we'll now move on to public comment for items 3 through 45. Do we have any? We do not have any public comment for items 3 through 45. Have I missed anyone? Seeing none, public comment is now closed for items. 3 through 45. Would any council members like to pull items 3 through 40, any items 3 through 45 for separate consideration? We'll first go to Alderman Ron Weifenbach. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to pull number 4 and number 5. Item number 4 and number 5. We'll now go to Alderwoman Amanda Scott. Thank you, Mayor. I'd like to pull items 18, 20, and 31 and 32, please. All right. So we have 4, 5, 18, 20, 31, and 32. We have a motion to approve the balance. Second. We have a, a motion by Laurenti and a second by Nordstrom to approve items 3 through 45 with the exception of 4, 5, 18, 20, 31, and 32. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, 
Items number four and five will go to uh, Alderman Chad Lewis to read these into the record for us. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Item number four is a request by Dream Design International Inc. for Technology Housing 2 LLC for a resolution to create a tax increment, increment district 75 for lots 1 through 16 and adjacent right of ways lots 1 through 16 of Block 5 Denim and Subdivision located in Subdivision 1, generally located at the, between St. Joseph Street and between Myrtle and Avenue, Maple Avenue. I move to set for hearing. We have a motion by Lewis and a second by Roberts. And if there's any object, if there's no objection, let's include five in that motion. Is that okay? By all means. With you, and uh, is that okay with the seconder? Okay. And we'll first go to Alderman Ron Weifenbach to speak on items four and five. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and I appreciate the. I, I believed I understood that it was the set of hearing. Uh, my question is, is that uh, I, I sat on the TIF committee on this item and. and uh, it got shot down at the TIF committee, got later approved at the um, um, Planning Commission. And my question here is, is that there's a process that needs to be followed for this TIF to be approved. And I, I would, at one point, I think our city attorney sent out a little bit of a, an outline kind of some items that were uh, missing from this, this TIF application. And I'm hoping that before that period of time that we'll have that available so we can look at that information, like the contracts, the, the financials, the, the uh, uh, contract from the bank, those types of things. So I'm not sure if I could, I don't know how to do that, if we're gonna set the hearing for December 1st, if I had to make a motion, or if it's something that, I mean, I believe it should have been something that was in the, during the process, it should have been there, but I didn't see it, and I haven't seen it yet to this day, and now we're setting a hearing for the 1st of December. I would like that information, Mr. Mayor. I'm not sure how okay. we, well, we handle can handle that. this a couple of ways. First of all, if our finance officer or city attorney have anything to add to this, we can go to them. Otherwise, what we can do is that we can proceed with setting for hearing, and if you don't receive the information that you're looking for at the hearing, you have every right to offer a motion to continue the, uh, the hearing, or in the alternative, if you want to state what those, you kind of already did, but if you want to restate what those items are and, and bring it up at a um, future committee hearing, you're, you're welcome to to do that. There's several ways to do this. I'm okay with setting a hearing. I just, I can't support something that doesn't meet the requirements of the process that was put in place over several years and several meetings and several periods of time. So I guess if we have that information available on December 1st, that would be, or before then, so we can look at it ahead of time, that would be pertinent. So, okay. Thank you. Do you have an idea of the information that you're looking for? Not off the top of my head, but I do have some emails that were sent by the city attorney that kind of outlined some of the okay. stuff that seemed to be relevant to this situation, so. We'll go to our city attorney, if that's all right. Joel and Dean. Joel. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I assume that the information that Alderman Weifenbach is referring to is the information that was on the, the item that was previously added to the agenda the discussion that occurred, and I can't remember the exact meeting date, but several weeks ago, and I did send out an email at that time generally discussing approval of TIFs, but not any specific documents that I can recall. Just that I believe the question that was posed to me was whether we could request those or not, and I could resend out that response, but again, I assume the documents he's requesting are the ones that he, the item was put on the agenda either Alderman uh, Weifenbach or Laurenti, I can't recall which one, and uh, there was a discussion at that time in my recollection as the council decided that it was premature to ask for those. So I think uh, it's kind of up to the council to, at this point, decide if you want those documents or not and let the applicant know, but uh, I assume it's the same documents that you were seeking at that, at that meeting. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I can, if I get the, uh, another copy of that email, I can summarize and send it to everybody and, and go from there, I guess. I can send an email back with the information that I think. Or, I, I mean, I, it, there's, it's a process that's in place to, by this council. I mean, it's pretty straightforward to me. So, but I can summarize what I feel is missing and maybe that would be helpful, I believe, okay. so. Alderman Steve Laurenti. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to amend the motion to include that stipulation for the hearing that that information be attached to items four and five. Um, it's from my understanding as well as what the city attorney has just said that there were That's some a, on the council. Why don't you offer your yep, amendment? There you go. We'll get a second to, to request that information. Okay, we have an amendment to the motion on the floor for items four and five that the, if I can summarize, the financial information that had been previously discussed at legal and finance uh, be provided as part of the, the hearing for items four and five. Is that's that, correct. Is that a fair summary? That's fair. Okay, so that's, we are now on the amendment only of the, of, uh, on this, only the amendment. So we'll hold comments to the amend me amendment and Alderman Lorente, you still have the floor if you want it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, I, I apologize for that. Uh, I should know that by now. Uh, my, my comments on that are that uh, some of the council thought it was premature to ask for that information the last time we discussed it, and I believe it would be pertinent for us to have that information available to give the developers the time to put it together, um, and December 1st is going to be the hearing. I would say it would be appropriate for us now to, to ask for that information. Whether it changes your mind about this partic these particular uh, agenda items, I think, is um, up to each individual, uh, each up to each one of us up here, but I believe the information is important for us to see so that we can all make that decision. Thank you. We'll go to Alderwoman Charity Doyle. Thank you, Mayor. Um, comment, potentially a question for Mr. Landine. I think when we had this discussion last time, I think we pretty much all agreed on the merits of the information that was being requested. I think one thing in um, fulfilling Mr. Weifenbach's request is to give us a clear distinction. This has gone through the TIF process. It's also gone through the Planning Commission with the TIF guidelines, and it was determined that this particular information was not part of that process. I'm hearing conflicting information. It's believed by some that it should be a requirement, and it is a requirement but was not provided, and it's I mean, it was unanimous through the Planning Commission that it was not required. So could you please give us a, a clear distinction on if that information needed to be provided and was not or didn't need to be provided just so that we, we, we have that moving forward. Thank you. Okay. Do you have a question to direct any? No, okay. We'll go to Alderman Jerry Wright. If I remember the discussion, that's when Hanny was here a while back. Let's make sure that the information that we're requesting is only information that's appropriate for the action that we'd be taking and not, not beyond that. Alderman Richie Nordstrom. Thank you, Mayor. I, I have to agree with uh, Alderman Wright. Uh, it's some of the information that has been requested was a little bit of out of order and um, the, uh, uh, some of that is remaining confidential uh, for that information uh, to become available. Um, and what I'm trying to recall as well is that what I remember it as is that the total price of the purchase of the property has not been totally settled yet. So that will weigh in and as a factor of, of all the uh, subsequent or subordinate items that need to be brought forward, but it, uh, I do believe it is still premature to ask for some of this information. However, I, having said all of that, if there is something that is appropriate, uh, uh, I'm willing to take a look at that. But uh, when we start getting into the area of confidential information, that's where I have to say no, we have to halt that process and uh, uh, delay that, that request. Thank you, Mayor. We'll go to Alderman Amanda Scott. Thank you, Mayor. Um, as the liaison to the Planning Commission, when this was brought forward at the Planning Commission and was approved unanimously, um, the application for the creating the TIF was complete as presented based on the TIF guidelines that are currently on the books. Now, I know the City Council, um, maybe about a year ago, maybe six months ago, between six months and a year ago, talked about redrafting or rewriting the TIF guidelines, but that was never finalized. And so, as far as I believe, we are still operating on the TIF guidelines that this application was submitted under. And again, at the Planning Commission, it was presented by staff and by the applicant 
in both cooperation, the, uh, the planning commissioners asked multiple questions on this issue, and the application as presented contains all the information as required on the TIF application to date. I do understand city council members wanting possibly some additional information, but the applicant, even at the planning commission, offered one-on-one -on -one sessions to go over that information and that data. Um, so I, I'm not opposed to getting more information. If anybody knows me up here, I truly am one of those people that will continue an item until all the information that has been requested has been, has been brought forward. But there's a difference here in when you're asking for private information that may not be subject to public knowledge and requiring the public information to go public or to go public with private information, we have rights against that and I would hate to step on those rights. So I just wanted to let everybody know on the City Council from the Planning Commission, the TIF application as presented stated by both staff and the applicant met the current requirements of a TIF application. And I didn't have any problem with the information that was presented on this. I, I, I'm ready to make my decision on December 1st at the hearing. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go to Alderman Brad Estes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I just, I'm not comfortable voting for this amendment uh, just for the fact that I'm not sure specifically what that information is. And I'm not, I haven't heard from our attorney as, as whether or not um, we're required or we have wherewithal to ask for this information that I'm not aware of. I mean, I'd like to be a little bit more specific, so I, I just can't support that amendment right now. Thanks. We'll go to Alderman Ron Weifenbach. I appreciate it, Mr. Mayor. And I, there was a, a, there was an outreach to, to, uh, review some information. You, we are dealing with private public money here. If this was just their own money, that'd be a whole different story. We are talking about taking taxpayers' future revenues and streaming them into a project. If you, and I went back to the meeting on some of the, on the first tip that was given over there at School of Munsters, and it was almost identical situation. And that was some of the information that Alderman Laurenti was looking for. Some of the information I'm looking for, and I understand Mr. Estes's point on uh, not being specific, and I'm, I'm willing to be specific and uh, allow our city attorney to deem pertinent whatever he felt was pertinent to, the, to make a decision. One of the decisions that you make when you make a TIF, the biggest one is, without the TIF, would this project happen? Okay. If you look at the performers that were provided, they were very vague. They have a specific project that already has the information given that tells you whether this can happen with or without the TIF. One of the, one of the things that I heard our city attorney say originally on that TIF, the first TIF that was given to buy the property for a million and a half dollars that they're now sitting on was that it would get an appraisal. To date, there's no appraisal for that first property, that first project. So I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm going by what the process says. I'm not asking for anything more than the process. I'm not asking for anything more than what is in the application. I'll, I'll be specific. I'll, I'll send my questions in to our city attorney, and you guys will all get them, and you'll be able to look at them and see if they make sense. But there's different levels of decision-making process that goes on up here, and some of us need to have the information that we feel is necessary. I'm not asking for anybody's private information. I'm asking to protect the taxpayers. That's what I'm challenged with. That's my job. There's a process that's set in place. I have nothing to do but talk about the process here. It's a process that happens. It says do this, do this, and this, and this can happen. That hasn't been followed. I sat on the TIF committee, and one of the reasons I turned it down was the simple fact that it hadn't met it. And I asked the city attorney to, to do a broad outline of, of some of the concerns, and he sent them to everybody. And, but I would have to say there was no real specifics. I will, I'll identify that. But I didn't expect this to be here tonight. I missed it somehow. And there was nothing attached to it. There's no link. There's no nothing. Um, so that's why I'm bringing it up, because I know if there's not a motion in place, nothing's going to happen. We're going to come to December 1st. And if you're ready to make a decision now, well, then maybe you can fill me in on how some of these things meet the criteria that's laid out in that tip. I would love to have that conversation, because one of the 
the, you know, the price of the property is one of them, the contracts that are available for them, the, the debt service on the property, the interest rates. There's, there's requirements for the notes on these properties to be vetted. We don't have none of that information. There's no information there that says this is going to be the specific interest rate. We're going to have a, a range. What is it? I mean, I mean, there's a big difference on one, two, three points on an interest rate, whether a project cash flows or not. And those are important to know. And when you have a project, you can already examine it and go, wow, okay, here's what happens. This is exactly what we know. There's five stories on that, on that building. Only four of them have revenue generated. So there's one full floor that doesn't generate any revenue. Why is that? You know, the, the rent revenues, I, I question. There's, there's several things that I question in it to make a good decision. Whether that'll change my mind on the process or not, I know. But at least the process will be followed. That's all I'm asking for. Anything that's in the process. Nothing more, nothing confidential. When you're dealing with, with the people's money, I don't think anything's confidential. When you come here and you say, hey, I want the taxpayers to participate, I think you give up a level of that confidentiality to the taxpayers so they know what they're spending their money on. There's nothing that I hide from them when I make decisions or, or, or I think when our administration makes decisions, they want to be as transparent as possible in, in the situation. So I will try to get nailed down the specifics, exactly what I need. I can't speak for Alderman Laurenti or any other Alder person up here who wants more specifics, but I'll nail down the specifics I have. Whatever our city attorney feels comfortable with, I'm sure I can make a decision based upon that information. So thank you. Thank you. Any further discussion on that? Now, we have a couple more lights, and I, w I want to emphasize that we're the applicants aren't here tonight, and this item doesn't have links for reason because it's not, it's, it's merely to set for hearing. So if we continue the discussion, we need to be careful to not have a hearing or any part of a hearing tonight. We'll go first to our city attorney, Joel Landine. Thank you, Mayor. I don't think, and if you look over the email I just resent out, it's, it's not really up to me to say you were required to submit this document. The, the provisions are written generally to give mm -hmm. some flexibility. The applicant would say they've provided all the documents that are needed. It seems there is certain aldermen that feel they would like additional information. And as the email I sent points out, ultimately the purpose of the requirements is that you have sufficient information in which to make a decision. If you do not feel like you have sufficient information to make a decision, then you can certainly request more information. If you feel like you have sufficient information, then you don't need to. By the same token, if the applicant doesn't want to provide the additional information, they're under no requirement to do so. And then that, at that point, you have to make a decision whether you feel comfortable moving forward. It's up to you to make the decision on this TIF, so it's up to you to decide whether or not you have sufficient information. It's not for me to say, yes, you have sufficient information to make the decision, or no, you don't. That is up to you as the decision maker to, to decide. Alderman Steve Laurenti. Thank you, Mayor. And I just wanted to clarify, and I can provide detail as well. I'm prepared to do that right now um, to the city attorney or whichever staff um, an office needs to make that request to the developer. But, the fact of the matter is we have an opportunity here where we planted a seed, whether you agree with that first TIF over in that area or not. The fact of the matter is we have a TIF already approved. It's active today, right next door to a TIF that we're wanting to approve or that we're going to be debating at the hearing. And we can use that information, which is the same financial data. We would not expect any more financial data for basically for what we're requesting than what we would have re would have asked for, for on that first TIF. So the fact of the matter is we have an opportunity to ask for that same information but get actual real world data rather than some projection as the city attorney has said there's some general requirements and you know the whether the developer has specific numbers at that time we don't know but the fact of the matter is we have the an opportunity to ask for that same information but get specific numbers because it's an active TIF. It's a current public financing deal and that's the information we would be asking for, nothing more, except that we would now be getting real world numbers. Thank you. Any further discussion on the motion? And since there's no further lights, I'd like to just make one more comment. And that is, 
if this gets to a tie vote, which I don't, I don't think that it will based on what I'm seeing from the discussion up here, but if it gets to a tie vote, I will break the tie in favor of, of you obtaining the information that you're seeking. And the alternative of that, I'd ask that you further delineate your questions, send them to me, and let me help you get the, try to help you get the answers. And um, so let's, let's proceed to the vote on the amendment. All in favor of the amendment, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Okay. Motion fails. I don't think we need a, need a roll call. We'll proceed to the vote to set these two items for hearing on December 1. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Motion carries with one no from Steve Laurenti. Thank you, everyone. Good discussion. We'll now move on to item number 18. We'll recognize Alderman Amanda Scott to read this into the record for us. Item 18. Thank you, Mayor. Item 18 is to authorize staff to seek proposals for engineering services for Fulton Street Reconstruction Phase 1 and Fulton Street Reconstruction Phase 2. And I make a motion to approve, and I'd like to retain the floor. Motion by Scott, second by Estes, and you have the floor. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, may I ask Terry Wolsterstorff a couple questions? You may. Thank you. Terry, I primarily pulled this off because it's the beginning of a project, and I thought it was a great educational tool. I even wrote that on here, educational tool. Number one, I'd like to really thank staff, all of staff, for the summary sheets and including the summary, executive summary information on the front page for the public as well as the city council members, especially this latest edition that I just recognize that says budgeted or not budgeted. That helps a lot from me having to ask that question every single time, so thank you. I'm sure you guys did it for your own selves, but thank you, I appreciate it. On this phase, my primary question, Terry, is this is going out for professional services. So this was budgeted, and I'm assuming that all the money for phase one and phase two has been budgeted for this project. According to the documentation on the inside, the actual phase one project is going to go forward or under construction in 2016 and the second phase in 2017. So when this is going out for bid, those funds are tied up, and is that part of the CIP carryover that's on that five-year plan? Yes, the, like for instance, the phase that's done in 2016, we'll, we'll bid it in 2016 when the funding, funding's available. Um, a lot of times that construction will carry over to the following year, and that's, that's what impacts that carryover amount that sometimes looks like it's very sizable, um, but it's because we have construction projects that are, that are under construction, and, and um, as you can see, some of these projects are, are close to $2 million in price. Yeah, this is, this is a quite large one, and I'm sure the, the, the people with property along this are really looking forward to this one going on. Um, the other question I had on here, and thank you for answering that one, that I know we've talked a lot about that, but it's hard to track dollars when you're crossing multiple years like that, when we're basically dealing with a yearly budget, but we're dealing with five-year plans, so I appreciate you explaining or clarifying that. The other question I have on here, too, and this is more just with the documentation on the letter that was written up here, I'm having a hard time reconciling where it says staff poses to hire a consultant that will be responsible for designing, bidding, and providing construction observation. And then at the bottom it says staff will prepare the bids for construction. So what is, does the consultant then work for the staff? Is, is that the language? that how this project goes forward yeah yeah thank thank you i'll try to clarify that i i think with that last phrase which is saying staff proposes to bid and construct project uh 15-2223 in 2016 i think what we're saying is our consultant will actually put the bidding documents together but we'll actually move forward with that bid um staff usually is the one who organizes and and we do the public noticing of the bids we open the bids um, but we have a consultant that actually prepares the design documents and all the bidding documents that go with it. Thank you. So if I'm understanding you, and I'm just asking just for my clarification, even though the city itself hires a consultant, what that consultant wants, if it's an engineering firm and it's overseeing the construction and making observations and running the test and making sure um, the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted, they still work with our city staff, and it's our city staff members that are still authorized control over the project that's correct we assign a project manager for every project thank you 
thank you for that clarification and, and I'll be, now that we've got a project that I can finally get my hands around, I'll be watching it over the next two or three years and seeing how this goes, so thank you. I yield the floor. Did you hear what Brad Estes said? No. He said stay out of his ward. Oh, <laughs> sorry Brad, and I know, you know, and, and you know, Alderman Estes has also told me in the past it's just simple math, but as we all know, when I try to do simple math up here, I can't do it. All right, Any, thank you very much. Any further discussion? On item 18, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries. Item 20, Amanda. Thank you, Mayor. Item 20 is to acknowledge the letter from the South Dakota Department of Environment and Natural Resources regarding the surface water discharge compliance inspection. I make a motion to acknowledge, and I'd like to retain the floor. Motion, and we have a second by Laurenti, and you have the floor. Thank you, Mayor. May I also ask Mr. Wolterstorff a question on this one? Terry? On this one, um, I know it came through Public Works and, and it looks good and, and number one, I'll be the first one to say this letter, and the public hasn't read it, it is a passing grade. I mean, there was nothing absolutely wrong with it. However, they did say that there was a potential problem identified and that was dealing with the size of the um, UV. Do I have that right? Correct. So my question to you is, they say that they would like to see some type of action before the next inspection. My question would be, so is this a yearly inspection or is this just arbitrarily whenever they come out to see us, like every three years, five years, 10 years? Thank you, that's a great question. Actually, I don't know if this is an annual inspection or a um, biannual or, or what that is. Um, of course, we are regularly inspected. We submit um, monthly reports to them on all of our testing practices. If we have any compliance issues where we're out of compliance with our permit, those are reported immediately, um, even after hours on a weekend, if they happen, they're reported immediately. Um, and, and yes, the, the letter is, the, only, the main reason we actually put it on the public works agenda is because over the last couple of years, we've had some compliance problems due mainly to some um, mechanical malfunctions and we've been doing a substantial amount of improvements out there. Um, but we put this on there just to let you guys know that we've been, we actually got a very good grade on this one and the, the one item they mentioned, which is the UV or the ultraviolet disinfection that we do out there, that's actually under contract right now for improvements. So we have a contractor out there working right now. That'll be completed before we start disinfecting again in I believe April is we, when we disinfect from April through October. So if that's being corrected now with the existing system, what the suggestion was was potentially upsizing if needed. Is there also a study going on to see if the city needs to upsize our system? Our, actually, our project that we're under contract right now takes care of what they're mentioning here. We're actually gonna be upsizing or increasing the amount of ultraviolet uh, disinfection equipment that we utilize. All right, and thank you for that clarification. I yield the floor. Floor has been yielded. Any further discussion on item 20? We'll go to Alderman Richie Nordstrom. Thank you, Mayor. And I too want to applaud the staff uh, for doing all the hard work and getting everything ready for this inspection. There's three particular individuals that are named in that letter that are recognized. And uh, I know the, the volume of work and letters and, and reports that they have to re prepare for this uh, inspection by the states. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, uh, Public Works Director uh, Walter Storff, I think this is like a PCI re report or inspection that they do not on an annual basis. And I think it's their call when they decide to come out and when, when, it's, when they do these inspections. My report is still loading and I can't bring it up and read it for verbatim on it. But that's my recollection is that the PCI is done uh, on an as needed basis. So. Uh, it's not an annual report, but but the the, the uh, UV system needs attention out there, and I hope to have uh, th this item, like to see it I item coming forward in the f near future, and it may be coming up as a standalone project, not coming through CIP or anything like that. So, um, again, it's just that the staff is doing tremendous work for the conditions and the atmosphere and the environment that they have to work in. Um, it, it's just, just can't say enough kudos for what the staff has to go through. Thank you, Mayor. Field the floor. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carries. We're now on item number 31. We'll go to Chad Lewis. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Item number 30, 31 is approved the Monday, excuse me, approved moving Wednesday, November 26th, 
2014, look on the Finance Committee to Tuesday, November 25th, 2014, immediately following the Public Works Committee. Move approval. We have a motion to approve, approve by Lewis and a second by Laurenti. Amanda Scott. Thank you, Mayor. Just wanted to pull this one because it is a different off week and the agendas won't come out until later this week, so we don't know what items are on there, but in case anyone is interested in what is happening at the Legal and Finance Committee meeting, it is going to be held on Tuesday of this week, and that's the only reason I was pulling it. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. 32. Mm -hmm. I have number 32 is a resolution 2014-108. Right enough on collectible accounts, receivable accounts. I move approval. Second. Motion to approve and a second by Nordstrom. We'll go to Amanda Scott. Thank you, Mayor. On this item, I found it very, very interesting. The total amount is um, significant, but, well, it's significant to me. It may not be significant to the city. There were primarily just two or three major contributors, and it looks like they probably are businesses or individuals that no longer reside in the city. My biggest question, and I'm not sure if Terry can answer this or if Pauline can answer this, but I found it very, very interesting on the, the billing that was proposed and has to be write off for someone who was on the scale at the landfill and drove off. Was that captured by video? Is that how we track them down by their license plate? Or, or how, how do we know that they drove off? I, I would say our scale operator, excuse me, our scale operator um, would be the one who would report that and the answer would be yeah we should have a video of the of the drive off more than likely but sometimes you, know, you may not be able to to locate them and recoup the money thank you Terry I know that a lot of the convenience stores and gas stations have surveillance tapes because of the drive offs I actually applaud the city if they've got the cameras out there and we can actually you know uh, make sure that the fees are being paid to the landfill that, that, are, that should be paid to the landfill. So I was kind of curious to see if we had tracked down our first video capture of someone driving off of the scale, but I guess I'll wait to hear about it. Yeah. It's actually a new show on Fox. Is it? Yeah. Reality TV? Amanda, how much was the amount that you're referring to? The amount that I was referring to, it's being written off, but it was a non-payment. It was for $25.02, but wasn't able to collect it even with them being caught and driving off the scale. So, but the significant one on there, Mayor, since you asked, was um, for a non-payment -pay on a damaged street light, and that was over almost $1,700. So wish we could have had that one, but unfortunately we didn't. So. My understanding is, Terry, is, it, is if it's written off, it can actually still be collected. So would, would you um, work with Alderman Scott to try to get her, get her answers on the two issues that she raised tonight, please? Yes, I will. Thank you. Any further discussion? We'll go to Alderman Ron Weifenbach. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to ask Mr. Warsendorf for a question. Go ahead. Sir. On a drive off, simply they could have drove up, weighed their truck, went up, dumped it, and then forgot to come back. That, that is probably what happened in this case because we looking at the dollar amount, 2502, there was a specific tonnage involved. So we had to weigh them going in, and they did right. not stop coming back out today. I mean, it's, it's something that can happen. Thank you. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries. We are now on items 40. What's that? The video is on YouTube. All right. We are now on items 46 through 110. Uh, we do have one speaker request form, and this is on item number 48, and we'll recognize uh, Bob Brandt. Good evening, Bob. And while you're coming up, I'll read this item into the record uh, so people watching know what we're talking about here. Is This is first reading of Ordinance 6023, an ordinance to revise the procedure and amounts uh, for parking violations by amending the municipal code. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Council. Um, I know Heidi Weaver kind of struggled on where to put this. It really doesn't pertain to the increasing the parking or changing the parking fines. I don't know how many if you've ever seen these before, but these are temporary parking permits where you can get when you're doing construction downtown. And what it allows is you pay $5 and you can stay in the same spot downtown all instead of moving it every two hours. Uh, the little problem is, is they're only good on commercial vehicles. Now, most of the projects downtown, the, the small remodels are done by smaller construction companies like my own. 
I have one or two carpenters that don't drive commercial vehicles, my lead carpenter, but they've got a lot of tools in their truck, so it's tough for them to go out and move their trucks every two hours. Um, what I'm proposing, if you guys saw the little letter, um, is to amend this, and, and I'm not really sure it takes an ordinance. I know I was working with Sergeant Scott Sills um, today, and we really couldn't find where it was in the ordinance. Um, if you look at 104415, the authority of the chief of police to designate temporary parking zones, we're not sure if that's where the authority for these passes came in or not, but what I'd like to propose is that on a, on a construction project downtown that we'd be able to, to allow, like say the building permit cost $1,000, which translates basically to about a $50,000 remodel, which is pretty big for downtown, that, we, that the chief of police would be able to allow two vehicles that do not have commercial plates to buy these parking passes. Um, on a bigger project, say a $2,000 building permit might be a $150,000 remodel. Maybe you could allow four parking passes that are not commercial plates. Um, it, would, it would certainly help rather than having our carpenters go out and move their trucks every two hours when they don't have commercial plates. So that's all I'm proposing. Thank you very much. We do not have any further speaker request forms on items 46 through 110. Have I missed anyone? <clears throat> Last call. Okay, public comment is now closed. We'll proceed with item number 46, Alderman Lewis. Item number 46 is first reading of ordinance 6020, an ordinance authorizing the issuance and sale of parking revenue, refunding bonds, and pledging certain revenues of the city of Rapid City. Payment of said bonds authorizing officers of the city to approve, execute, and deliver certain agreements and documents relating to bonds. I move approval. Motion by Lewis, second by Nordstrom. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carries. 47. Item number 47 is a first reading of ordinance 6022, an ordinance to provide for prepayment of claims for services by adding section 3.04.035 of the RAPS Municipal Code. I move approval. Motion by Lewis, second by Scott. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Opposed, motion carries. 48. Item number 48 is first reading of ordinance 6023, an ordinance to revise the procedure and Procedure for and amounts of penalties for parking violations by many chapters 10.40 and 10.44 of the Rapid City Municipal Code. I move approval and direct. Now let's move approval and yield the floor. Motion by Lewis, second by Scott. Any discussion? Alderman Jerry Wright. I just want to make sure that these two letters we received are part of the record. And also a question on the non commercial vehicles. When we issue this, do they have to have a commercial plate or can you issue it to if they have a private plate and they're a professional like a carpenter or a plumber? Is that the, is that the, the grounds for it, the basis? Our practice has been to issue them only to commercial plates. I'd like to see, please come back with a recommendation on how we can maybe straighten that out, if that's possible. Okay, thank you. Would you like to give a time frame for that? Is that all right if we vote on? First uh, reading is fine, but I think before the second meeting, I'd like to have maybe some assistance on how we could possibly do that. Um, sometimes we, we put a, a specific word on things. Sometimes we cripple things, and there's other examples I could use that are good examples, but uh, certainly a lot of professionals like carpenters or they do not carry a commercial plate, but I think Bob's got a valid point. Let's see if we can help. If we can't, we can't. Let's see what we can do. Perhaps another option would be to tie it to the, to the license as well, since the professionals are typically they're licensed by the city in some other capacity. Some of that might be an, an option if you have a building permit above a certain size and you have a, um, a permit. But well, that I, can I be talked about when it comes back. Maybe the, maybe the point is that, that the, uh, the permit is issued to do the remodeling and the employees, uh, if the deciding factors whether they have a commercial plate or not, I don't know if that, I don't think we have to stick to that that strictly because what we're worried about is the permit being done, or paid, and the work being done right. Um, I'd just like some thought on this. I'd certainly be willing to discuss it further myself, but I'm stuck for words right now or a solution for you, but I think we can do something. Okay. First go to, we'll next go to Charity Doyle, Alderman Charity Doyle. Thank you, Mayor. I guess my question would be for Chief Jagras, if I may. Go ahead. I'm, I'm curious, um, we didn't have the background information on this. What factors are actually driving um, this proposed increase, particularly on the, the parking fine structure? 
Um, the graduated parking sanctions, I think the primary purpose is to prevent the incidental citation for tourists or one-time visitors to downtown Rapid City. And so by replacing the first citation with a courtesy warning, um, then the second and third offense are gonna have increased costs. And really what we're trying to do is we're trying to control the behavior of those that are frequent and repetitive and maybe even intentional parking violators in the downtown area. As you know, we continue to get more of a demand on parking down there. There's, there's so many issues that we have four full-time employees dedicated to parking enforcement in the core area of downtown. Okay, was the courtesy issue, what, was there given any consideration given to out of town plates for a warning versus that before restructuring the, the entire process? No, this was a project that was done collaboratively between the police department, the city attorney's office, and finance. And first time offenders, regardless of where you're from, in a 90 day period would be treated the same. All right, and so, so what I'm hearing is that the only reason we looked at this was to alleviate um, some of these people that are coming down and, and maybe don't see the sign and you, they get a courtesy warning. That's one of the primary factors. We unintentionally are upsetting a lot of people that are downtown to visit or shop, and so this is a way to remove that those problems and that conflict that occurs. Was there any reach out to the downtown association or the downtown business owners? Yes, the downtown association was involved in the discussions leading up to this concept. Okay, that's all I have for now. Thank you. We'll next go to our city finance officer, Pauline Sumption. Pauline. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, two things. First of all, I think that we need to keep Mr. Brandt's item completely separate from the ordinance because it is currently not found in the ordinance anyway. And um, Chief Jaggers and I were talking before the meeting, and we want to sit down and really analyze what is going on. Um, this is handled all by, that part of it is handled all by his office. And so there's nothing in the ordinance for it right now. So I'd like to hold those two things separately. Just to ta cha or excuse me, tag on a little bit to what Chief Jaggers was saying, um, part of the, the thought process and the dollar amounts for the graduated fines, first of all, it's been years since we have even looked at our parking fine structure. And I have some information that I'm actually going to ask um, be attached to the second reading. Going back to 2011, um, how many people had first time offense tickets, second time, third, et cetera. Also, there's some history on there, some research that Loanne did that looks at other communities and what their tickets are. And if people think that what we're proposing is outrageous, you should see some of these other communities, including Aberdeen, South Dakota. Um, it, it's quite eye-opening. I feel like we're still reasonable. We do have parking revenue bonds. Granted, you just approved first ring of an ordinance tonight to refinance those. However, we still have covenant requirements that we have to make. So in looking at the dollar amounts for um, our proposal in the ordinance amendment, I took the numbers from 2011 and applied the $5 per ticket in addition to the graduated fines. And for it's reasonably revenue neutral based on those number of tickets. And if that's the case, we're still okay with our bond covenants. But if we lose money, because I know there's a letter here um, voicing some concerns about the, raising the fees, but if we lose money ex extensively, we will not meet our bond covenants. And that could cause more problems than just this one bond issue. So I guess when you, when you hear the complaints of the citizens and the business owners, while I understand their concerns, we, we still have to meet those bond covenants. We have to keep that in mind. In addition, um, as Chief Jagger said, we do have some repeat offenders that they're the ones that are concerned about this, but we have multiple um, eight and 10 hour meters downtown within a, on Kansas City Street, on Quincy Street. There, there are places where they can park that aren't too far away. And we are trying to encourage employees specifically 
to use those locations and leave those spots in front of the businesses for the customers, the ones that bring the sales tax into downtown, the ones that go to their businesses and, you know, basically pay for their employees' wages by, by purchasing items there. If those spots aren't open for their customers, that's a bigger problem, I think. And so that's one of the things that we were thinking about, too, when we were looking at the graduated fines. We'll now go to Alderman Steve Laurenti. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, I just wanted to thank the finance officer that answered a lot of my questions. However, I still have a couple left. Because my one of my main concerns was whether it was going to be revenue neutral or so that we could meet our bonding. So I was glad to hear that. Um, if I, I just wanted to add some clarity maybe and, and uh, Alderman Wright can maybe come in on this because I would like to see that same information not attached to these two things. I think that it's unrelated, but I think Mr. Brandt's um, proposal has some merit to it. My question to you, Chief, uh, maybe some other thoughts on this to come back with some information. Maybe we can direct staff to, to do something separately from these two items um, that evening when we, uh, I, I assume, we'll approve these. Um, but on this particular uh, item that Mr. Brandt brought forward, what's the feasibility of it? Do we have the capacity to do that, knowing how limited uh, parking is downtown? Um, Mike, the other question I have is... If you don't mind is, me interrupting you, know, sure. on, on that particular question with Mr. Brandt's letter, let's, let's, let's put that on legal and finance um, next week and let's take that out of, out of this particular um, discussion and just focus on this because that's really a, a, a separate process and a separate issue, if you don't mind. I don't. Okay. I don't. Go ahead with your other... No, I'm good. I'll yield the floor. I, I, I can reserve my comments for that uh, particular issue at legal and finance. Thank you. Richie Nordstrom. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I've gotten several phone calls uh, about this in some personal context, primarily from the YMCA area um, on this. And uh, I believe I've gotten all the answers and, and support from the staff uh, to explain it back to those folks that are asking these questions. Uh, and I, I believe we got that portion of those questions cleared up for them. However, there's still their main concern is what are we doing for their, what we, meaning they, the YMCA, is doing for their staff volunteers. And then also a new subject that came up for them as, as far as uh, the, uh, the membership, uh, because their major concern is, is what that uh, will do for their membership as well. So I, I almost kind of consider some of these chronic violators as doing this as as part of their business, they just factored in as 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 normal expense for parking downtown. So um, I don't mind taking a real serious look at at the data that that is becoming available on the uh, chronic violators. Um, and the other one has to do with the employee parking. I totally agree that is going to be a constant issue to deal with that. I know some businesses will terminate employees if they park in front of or very near for, to their businesses. And uh, so some businesses are being very progressive about that. And this leads into a very long-term issue, and I don't want to discuss it tonight, but I just want to put it, plant the seed, is that um, we've had this discussion about an additional parking ramp in this area of town, any, in, anyway, near the YMCA and over on the west side. So uh, I just want to plant the seed that we need to take a look in that area. Thank you. Alderman Jerry Wright. I too had some calls from businesses downtown concerned about impact on their businesses, whether they can continue to function and, and so forth with parking limitations. And uh, I think it's been a tackle, uh, a task for the city for years. I just want to remind everybody that about a year ago, we were looking at President's Plaza which would have brought a parking structure to downtown Rapid City and it slipped through our fingers. So we need to reinvigorate and get that or something like it going because the downtown area is growing and the demand is there and uh, it isn't, it isn't there, there's more people and, and the spaces have not increased. The town hasn't grown and I think we need to do something and we missed a chance a year ago. Thank you. Alderman Ron Weifenbach. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I, I, this is so reminiscent of uh, 
a few years back when we did the whole complete downtown study of all the parking spots. All, and if people park downtown, you realize if you're two blocks off of downtown, you're metered. If you're on Main and St. Joe, you're not metered. Okay. We had this discussion about how you control it. Uh, I think our finance officer pointed out uh, an important fact that we have to understand that some of the offenders are paying for the spots that other people are getting subsidized to be used, like the ramps, the snow removal, those types of things that all come inherent with parking. So when, as we go forward and we identify this, it's uh, uh, first time offenders. I mean, I'm not sure how many of them are complaining about, you know, parking in a spot. I think in this world in today's day and age that most people know if you're gonna park downtown, no matter where you're at, probably gonna have either a meter or you're gonna have some sort of time limit on how you should park there. So it's really complicated to feel bad for somebody getting a $5 ticket. I've gotten a couple of them myself just by overextending my time frame, but I, I do know that there's a complete resistance against metering Maine and St. Joe, which generates revenue for the, the things that they, they, they have now with all the parking ramps and the parking, uh, the, the flat level parking, all that stuff. So it, it's important that as we move forward and we, we talk about this is that we keep in mind that the offenders pay a lot of money for the people that are using the parking spots and the, and the the ramps and whatever have you and you know, yeah you're right there is an opportunity we've been on hold for several years on a parking ramp that would have been downtown at one point in time the councils before us had decided that they would look into a private public partnership that hasn't transpired yet which hasn't allowed that parking lot to go forward so moving forward if if we all agree on the numbers i can support whatever fine fines we have available and understanding that 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 money is used to subsidize people that are in the ramps, that people that are in the flat parking, all those areas, so that at the same time, maybe there's an opportunity to look at what we're charging. It costs a lot of money to park. People that own businesses in our community understand that. You know, when they come down and get their city permits and they have to put in parking spots and then they get taxed on them, all those things, it, it costs a lot of money. So the people that are in downtown, in their businesses downtown must understand that it costs money to remove snow, it costs money to maintain the, the flat levels, the parking ramps, all those, the, all those things cost money. And that's what causes some of this. And, and we'll, we'll never ever make 100% of the people happy on this idea, no matter how we approach it. But the main thing is that, like our finance director said, is that we do have bonds out there that are paying for parking that we have available. We start teetering with those things that could jeopardize where we're at, so making sure that we're at minimum neutral. But looking moving forward, if they want more parking, the fees are going to have to be raised either you know with the offenders or the people that are paying the you know directly paying those. So keeping that in mind, I think that this I'm not sure if this has been vetted like that. I guess I'm not sure, but if make sure that we do vet it. I can support whatever decision comes forward. So thank you. Thank you. Any further discussion? This is first reading. All in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries. If we can if we can just get a, a quick motion here to refer the request by uh, Mr. Brandt uh, regarding Second. parking for construction workers, we'll refer that to the next legal and finance meeting for further discussion. Mm -hmm. Motion by Lewis, second by Estes. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, item number 49, Mr. Lewis. Item number 49 is second reading of ordinance 6018, ordinance to consolidate the Vision City and Capital Vision City. Boy, the city's vision and capital improvement funds in the separate accounts within a unified fund by amending chapter 3.16 the Rapsi Municipal Code. I move approval. Second. Motion by Lewis, second by Wright. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion carries with one no from Alderman Weifenbach. Item 50. And 50, second reading of ordinance 6002, an ordinance to amend chapter 15.14 of the Rapid City Municipal Code to adopt 2012 International Property Maintenance Code and move approval. Second. Motion by Lewis, second by Scott. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. 51. Item 51 is a second reading of Ordinance 6011, excuse me, an ordinance to amend the Rapid City Municipal Gas Code by amending certain provisions in Chapter 15.20 of the Rapid City Municipal Code. I move approval. Second. Motion by Lewis, second by Scott. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. 52. Item number 52 is second reading of Ordinance 16, 6017, Ordinance to adopt an 
the 2012 International Building Code by amending Chapter 15.12 of the Rapids Municipal Code. I move approval. Second. By Lewis, second by Scott. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Item 53? Yes. Item 53 is first reading of Ordinance 6019. The ordinance amending Section 17.06 of Chapter 17 the Rapids Municipal Code to create a plan union development zoning district in the described property generally located at uh, Elkvale and Taggart Road, North Elkvale and Taggart Road. I move approval. Motion by Lewis, second by Nordstrom. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carries. 54, we'll go to Amanda Scott. Amanda. Thank you, Mayor. A request by Fisk Land Surveying and Consulting Engineers, Inc. for Founders Park, LLC for a preliminary subdivision plat for proposed lots 10 and 11 of Founders Park subdivision. Located, generally located west of Founders Park Drive and Philadelphia Street intersection. And I make a motion to approve. Second. Motion by Scott, second by Lewis. Any discussion? Seeing none. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries. 55. Amanda. A request by Ferber Engineering Company for Aspen Ridge Lawn and Landscape LLC for a preliminary subdivision plan for the proposed lot one of Country Meadows subdivision. Uh, generally located at the southeast corner of the intersection of Croyle Avenue and Sheridan Lake Road, and I make a motion to approve. Motion by Scott, second by Lewis. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries. We have a motion to approve items 56 through 110. I need to abstain from item 56. Oh, okay. We'll pull item 56. Are there any other, either, any other items that need to be pulled for separate consideration, 56 through 110? Seeing none, can we have a, a motion to approve 57 through 110? Motion by Scott, second by Doyle. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, motion carries. Item 56, Chad, would you read this into the record for us? Item number 56 is uh, on sale liquor license for Buffalo Wild Wing, oh, excuse me, BDUBS, UDubs, okay, BDubs, whatever. Doing business as Buffalo Wild Wings, 715 Mountain View Road on for real retail hunt sale liquor license and move approval. We have a motion for approval and we have a second by Doyle. Any discussion and we, we will have one abstention. What does all in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, motion carries with one abstention from aye. Alderman Brad Estes. That takes us to all the way up to item 111. We, we have public hearing is now open for items 111. Uh, through 117, I do not have any speaker request forms from these items. Have I missed anyone? Have I missed anyone? Okay. Uh, seeing none, we have a motion to approve items 111 through 116. A motion by Doyle and second by Lewis. All in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries. And actually 116 is a hearing item, so that needs to be, uh, that was through 115. So we'll go now to 116. Chad Lewis, if you'd read this into the record for us. This is an ordinance. All I do is work. Okay. <laughs> Item number 116. Really? <laughs> this entire thing? No. Okay. First line and the last second, line. Second please. reading of ordinance 6016, an ordinance amending section 17.06, chapter 17. The Reps Missile Code rezoning, was zoning within inscribed property as requested by the City of Rapid City for Countryside Homeowners Association for rezoning from no use district to low density residential district for all of Countryside subdivision, generally located at north of Sheridan Lake Road between Murfield Road and Clarkson Road. I move approval. Motion by Lewis, second by Laurenti. Any discussion on item 116? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carries. Bill list, Pauline Sumption. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I do have four additions to the bill list. First one is to J.V. Bailey Company, Inc. for the 2014 bridge repairs change order number 1F for $1,028.01. J&J Asphalt Company for pavement rehab at Burns Drive, change order number 1F for $2,450. Hills Materials Company for 2014 Parks Parking Lot Repair, change order number 1F, $262.50 and Pennington County Treasurer for property taxes at Canyon Lake Park and Utility Maintenance Facility for $5,907.67, bringing the new grand total to $9,748,015.65. Motion by Laurenti, second by Estes. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, motion carries. We have a motion to adjourn. Motion by Lewis, second by Roberts. All in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, motion carries. We're adjourned.
Have a good evening. Have a good evening, everyone. It's 7:49 p.m. and we are adjourned.